Gospel of John, chapter 18. And we want to continue, uh, really, this will be our third sharing on uh, uh, Jesus as the son of David. And uh, discovering <coughs> this reality and this parallel between David and Jesus, that they both, the first part of their ministry, they were rejected kings. <coughs> they were king. Both of them were already kings, but they were rejected. Uh, they also uh, did not make a big deal out of it. They more or less hid the fact that they were king. People, anyone that acknowledged either one of them during that time uh, was based on something that they saw beyond the pomp, the pomp, the dress, the manner in which a king would look and carry himself to prove to people that he is a king. Neither Jesus nor David did that. They were king. And they manifested not the glory of official glory of being a king, but they manifested the glory of the character of a king, a true king, an honorable king. <clears throat> and uh, so we looked at some of this last class, but we want to look at it a little more here in relationship with Jesus. And in John 18, <clears throat> verse uh, 33, Jesus is, is before Pilate, and um, verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Now, <clears throat> before we go on, I want to I want to quicken your sensitivity to this statement because I want to show, in the next two chapters, I want to show that Pilate was a little more in tune with this thing and was a little more moved by this thing that Jesus was actually a king. This is his first inquiry into this and he says are you the king of the Jews now, <clears throat> now consider this Jesus is standing there he's got this one piece robe on remember it's the one that they part his garments and stuff like that he's got um, he's, he doesn't look like a king he's wearing nothing that a king would wear He's, he's got no entourage around him. He has absolutely nothing that says that. If Pilate checked it all, in, and I'm sure, it, you know, I mean, Jesus, you know, for the last three and a half years, a big uproar had taken place in Jerusalem. And I am sure that Pontius Pilate heard of Jesus. He probably heard that he was from Nazareth, which... You know, less, I mean, it, it bids, you know, the question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Much less a king. That his disciples were fishermen and tax collectors and that sort of thing, sort of the lower echelon. But Pilate looks Jesus in the eyes and says, well, are you the king of the Jews? Okay, again, this is going to be important. But my first question to you is, why would he ask such a question? You, you know, you would say, okay, well, he asked the question because one of the accusations against him was that he was king of the Jews. That's fine, but come on. You wouldn't say, are you the king of the Jews? You would go, Dude, you're not the king of the Jews. Why are you dressed that? Why are you acting this way? You know? You're from Nazareth, for God's sake. <clears throat> All right. But, but Pontius Pilate will not get off of this subject right here to the bitter end. Because remember, kenosis is that you hide your official glory. And you live in the glory of nature. You live by the nature that brings glory to God and therefore 
honor from people because they see the Lamb, they see the life of Christ, they see the nature of the Lord, they see something of character and nature that glorifies God and draws people. But so Jesus, when he came in his kenosis, he emptied himself of all official glory and of all trappings that would draw glory to him based on anything other than someone discovering the true king within that would not go by the outward, that would not be caught up in the circumstances, that would find the man, if you will. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? That would find the person, not just what he says he is or what others say of him. That would go past everything and find the essence and in finding the essence, discover a king that nobody else seemed to discover. So he asked, Art thou the king of the Jews? In verse 34, Jesus answered him, saying, <clears throat> so, or Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it um, thee of me? Now that's a good question. Why is that a good question? Because he wants to know where he's coming from. That's exactly right. He, he wants to know, has this guy truly discovered me? Because I'm in kenosis. I am... I, am, I have hidden my glory. How has this guy, has this, you know, this procurator, this governor, whatever, whatever position Pontius Pilate was, it was in, he's, go, he's a little awed in a moment there going, wait a minute, did you come up with this yourself or did somebody else tell this to you? Well, Pontius Pilate's response was not, the most promising, but he never leaves this thing. He never, he never leaves this thing. And um, so, you know, basically, uh, well, let's, let's just read a little more. In verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from here. All right, there are two meanings in his words here. One is, well, my kingdom's not from down here. If it really was from down here, we would fight for it, but it's from up there. Okay, that's, okay, that's probably the most common understanding. But the other one is, is that my kingdom is not of the nature of this world. It's not like all other kings that want everybody to know that they're a king. That is, that is all about governing people. All about taxing people. All about the honor of man. All of it is about that. It's about prestige and power and pride and that's the only, the three P's I could think of. And, and uh, Jesus may also be saying, my kingdom is not of this realm. It's not like this. It's not out from it. My source is not this and the character and spirit behind it is not of this. Um, because if we were like that, we would fight for it. Does that make sense? Well, that doesn't sound like the lamb. That doesn't sound like the king on the throne, which is who? Lamb on the throne. Lamb on the throne. King on the throne. Who, who had their hand up? Yes. Right. 
Now, I just want to say, this is all great teaching and everything, but I'm really not into just good teaching and stuff like that. What I want us to discover is this when we get into practical situations, because let me tell you something, when somebody doesn't honor you, when somebody doesn't recognize you for the great person that you are, do you say, well, you know what, my kingdom's not of this world? Or do you fight back in some manner, even if it's just a, you know, even if it's just a phrase? I mean, even if it's just a sentence, then the king did not speak that sentence. Pride spoke. What is that I hear? Pride speaks. Not you. Jealousy speaks. That wasn't you. That was your jealousy ruling over you. That was your pride then in that situation ruling over you. The king didn't speak because you're not king. Pride is your king in this moment. And in this moment over here, jealousy is your king. Are you hearing me? Have you ever been talking to somebody you knew and everything and all of a sudden pride speaks? Not them. Literal pride within them uses their mouth, their tongue, their lips, and pride just spoke. And you, you can hear it plainly as you listen. You're going, this is, this is not them. They have now bowed their knee to pride and allowed pride to speak here. They have at this moment bowed their knee to jealousy and allowed jealousy to speak through them. Jealousy speaks, not the king. Jealousy speaks, not the person. Okay? That's important because that's a fact. That's a real thing. That, what I just described right there is not a fairy tale. That is proof of are you a king? Are, is Christ king in you? And have you become his feet so that everything is under his feet. Pride, jealousy, all that. Or does when it rules, it just doesn't take its rule at every given moment. But when it wants to, it steps up to the throne, sits down, takes over for as long as it wants to. And you say yes, sir, and no, sir, to it. You getting my point? So... Um, so Jesus says, my, my kingdom, you know, he didn't say I'm a king <laughs> because that would be declaring himself on an official manner. And right now he's in kenosis, but he is a king. So he says, my kingdom, it's not of this world because if it was, and if we were like everyone else on this earth, we would fight for it, to be known, to be honored, to get some kind of glory, to, to, to avenge ourselves of the lack of glory, the lack of honor that we should have received because we did this and this is what you give back in return. You don't fight for that. You fight for the right to lay down your life. And how many people, honestly, that you know of, anywhere fights for the right to lay down their life fights for the right to lay down their life so that the father will be glorified by the nature it will be the glory of nature that is like sweet incense rising to the father or it's us teaching and preaching and talking about this and making a big deal out of it only to find that when we get into the crisis, something else is king. Some other attribute will rise and demand its say. Even, even, if, even if it only says one sentence and then goes back down. You see what I'm saying? All right. So... Um, Jesus ends that verse with, but now is my kingdom not from here. So standing before Pilate is a king. Standing before Saul in the cave was a king. Amen? 
David stood there and he was king, not Saul. And, and David did not, and listen carefully to this, David did not kill the usurper king so that he could be king. He was already king and proved it by not killing him, by not fighting for it. It's funny, but you know, all this battling between David and Saul really wasn't a lot of battling between David and Saul. It was primarily Saul. David wasn't fighting for the kingdom, wasn't fighting for the throne, wasn't fighting for Jerusalem, wasn't fighting for even Hebron or, or Judah. He was fighting for his life, as it were, but Saul was the pursuer at every given moment. Saul was the pursuer. David did not fight back, and what little things that he did smote him deeply. Why? Why well, should never have done that? He's the king. There's something greater. There's a greater king in David's life. The kingdom is the government of Christ within him, and when he violated it, even on a small level, it smote his conscience, and he could not move forward from there and said, Oh, God, forgive me. You know, folks, I have... You know, there's that parable Jesus told of the two sons. And the father comes to one son and says, Son, come work with me in my field. And that son says, No, I'm tired. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. But later on, repents and goes and works in his field. So the father goes to the other son and says, Son, come work in my field. And he says, Okay, yes, sir. I'll be right there. And never goes. And Jesus said, Which one do you think was a true son? It is possible to say the wrong thing or to do the wrong thing. David did, but it smote his conscience and he got back on track as quickly as he could. Amen? It is possible to say the wrong thing. But you get, and that one son did. No, I'm not going to do it. But then the king kicked in. You understand what I'm trying to, well, how I'm trying to convey this. There was a higher government. The Lord was king, and he rose up. Okay, those little failures, and, and they're, they're, to them, to those who did them, they're not little. David, you know, cutting a piece of his cloth off and then later going, oh, God, I can't believe it. You know, it's like the end of the world for them. But in light of eternity, they are little things that happened that were immediately turned by the government of God within them, and they'll not be remembered, not one iota. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, just read Hebrews 11, you know. The fathers of faith, the heroes of faith, and, and you know, like, be like Jephthah or Samson or da-da-da. And you go, you know, Samson messed up a bunch, but, and so did a lot of other people. Abraham messed up a bunch. David messed up. But in Hebrews 11, it doesn't mention any of those. It only mentions that their faith stayed with the Lord their heart, their trust, and all of that, Father didn't even remember it. Because why? Because God never just forgives you. Never. He always forgives and forgets. Uh, I, I told this story a few times, but years and years ago when the Father was trying to teach me this, you know, I was fairly young in the Lord, but he was trying to teach me this principle. And one time I went to the Lord and I said, Father, forgive me for this, this thing, and I'm so sorry, and da-da-da-da. And he said, okay, you know, I mean, basically I forgive you, covered by the blood, da-da-da-da. And, you know, about a week later or something, it came to my mind again, and I just felt bad again. And I went back, and I, oh, Father, you know, just forgive me if da-da-da-da. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, Please don't make me say it all out again. I'm just so ashamed and everything. Please, you know, just forgive me and, and let's go on. He said, what are you talking about? 
okay, you know what it was that I did. It was, it was da 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 And he said, I don't remember that. Uh, and then it hit me. So I was going to say, what do you mean? It was horrible. You, you know. But before I could get it out of my mouth, I went, he doesn't remember it. He said he will cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. He will cast it as far as the east is from the west. And when you bring it up, he doesn't have a clue. After the first initial time, he doesn't remember it. And that changed my whole way of operating because for years I would repent and then I'd keep going back to the Lord and feeling bad. And, and I would keep repenting for probably a year or more until I felt like he forgave me. Well, since when has this thing been based on me, or number two, my feelings about the situation? <laughs> Amen? He forgives, and he always forgets if he forgets. If he forgives, he forgets. Amen. And you have to remember that, you know, and don't forget it. <laughs> Let him forget it. You remember. <laughs> All right. Verse 37 Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Because he said, Are you a king? And Jesus said, Well, where would you get that information? Because Jesus wanted to know, Is he really tuning into who I am? But then Jesus says, My kingdom is better. And so Pilate goes, Then are you a king? You said your kingdom? Are you a king then? See, he, there's something big here with his, He's being pulled by something. He's, I mean, this, he is a, Ro a Roman authority and in a higher class. He understands leadership and authority. And he's got Jesus in front of him and he's perceiving there's something. Are, are you a king? You know, I don't know you really, but are you a king? Because he's, you know, he can detect things. So then he asked again, Pilate therefore said un unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. All right. See, he didn't say, To this end came I, that I should be king. That's the way we read that. He said, to this end was I born and came that I should bear witness to the truth. Because a king will do that. He is of such a character that he stands up for the kingdom. He stands up for the father of the king and the highest authority in his life. He, he, and he says in these words right here, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Not everyone that, that sees externals that prove I'm a king, but rather the fact that I am kingly and how I stand for the truth and will not falter and will not fail. I am Lancelot. <laughs> you know, I am pure. Do you understand what I'm trying to communicate and in that stance he says those who know the truth will be able to hear from this king and recognize him as a king not because I told him I was a king because he didn't did he? <laughs> because it can't be by words uh, and, and and trying to it can't be by trying to convince people of something you, you know I mean that, that's the way the world operates but if they can't see the king, there's no need trying to convince them of anything. No need at all. Don't waste your time. Just go right on being kingly by letting the king live through you. All right. So everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. But Pilate says, Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? When he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. <laughs> I mean, this guy is, now he is, this is the beginning of getting under this thing. Because he is perceiving something about this man. And he is perceiving because the, the veil 
is over the Holy of Holies, and yet he feels that there's something behind there. Do you understand what I'm saying? He feels like, ooh, you know, it's, there's something behind there, and it's powerful, and it's glorious, and it's kingly, but he's not showing it to me. Have you ever read these scriptures and ever thought in your own mind, well, I want Jesus to say it. Anybody? I certainly have. I read that over and I go, God, Jesus, just tell them. You're making this so hard. Just say, Pilate, I'm it. I'm the son of God. I'm the king of kings. You kill me, you'll burn in hell forever. <laughs> I mean, that was when my early days, that was, you know. Well, isn't that kind of what we do to people? Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. You don't accept him, you'll burn in hell forever. You know. And they never, ever truly know the king by essence. And they never perceive him for themselves. They just run from hell. They just run in fear to the guy that you said was king. See, But I would rather people to know him for themselves and to truly, truly perceive him. So... Um, Pilate goes out to the people after that little tete-a-tete -tete with Jesus and says, I find in him no fault at all. Okay? Then verse 39, but you, but you have a custom that I should release unto uh, you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? <laughs> Are you getting it? Dude, he is genuine. He, see, he didn't say the guy that you charged or Jesus of Nazareth or whatever he said do you want I mean because he see he came out and said I don't find any fault in him at all if he was mocking Jesus he would come out and say well I found just basically only one fault he thinks he's the king of Jews but you see what I'm saying so I mean you could you could read this by thinking that he's saying do you want me to deliver unto you the king of the Jews by sort of mocking him? But I don't think there's a mockery at all in the fact that he said, I find no fault in him. Do you, would you rather me release unto you the king of the Jews? That's his statement. Jesus said, you say that I am. <laughs> That's his own statement. And it's his statement to the people. And, and he went out there with the intention of, number one, telling him that I can't find any fault in him. Number two, I'm telling you as the king of the Jews. And actually, number three, I want to try to release him. Okay? So, of course, uh, verse 40, Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas, now Barabbas was a robber, and Jesus was a king, but he was a veiled king. He was a king in Kenosis. How many of you are kings in Kenosis? The Bible says you're priests and kings. How many of you are kings in Kenosis? He was a king in Kenosis, and Barabbas was a robber, and they made their decision based on what? They didn't, they, all they perceived from Jesus was a threat. He's threatening something in my life. Now, Jesus didn't threaten anything, you know, but that's the way they perceived it. So, you know, uh, Barabbas, you know, if you're one of the Pharisees, you're thinking Barabbas is going to have to rob a whole lot of houses before he gets to mine. So this could be years from now, but Jesus is a threat right now. Barabbas is a threat to my possessions, but Jesus is a threat to my prestige and my position and my pride and the honor that I get. Jesus is a threat to my official glory. So, you know, they yelled, crucify. So then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns, because they heard all this talk about a king, 
and put it on his head, and they put, him, put on him a purple robe and say, said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Now, clearly, these guys didn't think he was a king. But that doesn't matter because he was a king standing right there in front of them. He, would they, you know, the king that those Roman soldiers honored was who? Caesar. Caesar was the king. Would they have treated Caesar this way? Never. Jesus is the king of kings. Clearly, they didn't perceive that. What, I'll tell you exactly what they saw. They saw a Nazarene, or a Nazarite, uh, either way you want to put that, a man from Nazareth, let's put it that way. And they saw a guy who hung out with fishermen, and they saw a guy that hung out with tax collectors, and they saw a guy that the, probably the best of the best, and this is the honest truth, the best of the best as far as who they were and what prestige that they brought to the circle that Jesus was in, the 12 in him, was a man named Judas. He was the only one from Jerusalem. The rest of them weren't even from Jerusalem. He was the only one that had any kind of a honorable background, so he was given the purse and the money and the, the, had the accountant and this sort of thing. The one with the highest official glory... saw to it that Jesus was put to death. So these Roman soldiers, they, they can't, you know, they're, they're brutes. They can't see past the veil. <clears throat> so, let's see. Now, all that said, and notice how often this thing, King of the Jews, keeps coming up. Okay? Now, same chapter, Let's go on down to verse 19. This is where they, well, verse, uh, let's start at uh, 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one, and Jesus in the, in the center, in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. <laughs> I mean, I think this guy was actually convinced, I am in the presence of royalty here. I'm trying to get him free. I try, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I don't, you know, now I don't think that he bowed his knee to the king. I don't think he said, I will serve the king the rest of my life. But I think because of his background and because of his authority and everything, he perceived he was seeing past the veil somewhat to see there's more to this man than the credit we're giving him. Okay? So he writes this title on there, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Verse 20, this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Who do you think had it written not just in Hebrew but in Greek and Latin? Latin was spoken by the Romans. Greek language was the language of the day. The Hebrew language was the language of the country in which Pilate ruled. He put it so everybody can read it. Now, come on. Something's up with this guy. You know? No, no. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, let's go ahead and read that. Um, Jennifer mentioned verse 14 and 15. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, 
that's just a lie. <laughs> I mean, it is amazing what links people will go to to make sure that Jesus gets no official glory at all. They didn't honor Caesar as their king. They hated the Romans. Not only that, Caesar didn't just declare himself to be a king. He declared himself to be God. Okay. So there is no self-respecting Jew going to say we have no king but Caesar. But they're trying to put the fear of Caesar in Pilate to get him to do this thing. And he's saying, you know, Pilate's the one who should have said, we need to crucify, I find fault in him. We need to crucify this guy. He thinks he's a king, and I'm a Roman, and Caesar's the only king. Now, that's the way a true Roman would speak. But he's, trying, he's going, look, this is your king. We don't recognize him as that. Okay. When they, when they stood there and he says, behold your king, and we, you know, in their minds they said, we don't recognize him as that, does that make him not their king? Well, no, I mean, he is king of kings and lord of lords. More importantly, within him, in his being, in his nature, he is king. Yes? Um, I don't know about how much you agree with this, but, you know, David was king because he was anointed by God as king. Absolutely. And he wasn't recognized or, or given that or acknowledged as king. Until, I mean, he came into it, but there was that whole time that he was, according to the Lord, he was the king and he was on the run and he was fleeing and he wasn't given that also, you know, and it didn't change the fact that he was king. And that, that was the point, I think, of Jesus being called the son of David because he was after the nature of his father. He was a reflection of his father, David. And Jesus was called the son of David, yes. That, that same kind of principle in Paul, in Second Corinthians, because he's writing to vindicate his apostleship, but in the middle of the whole thing he says, I am base when I'm among you. And so it's like, well, you're trying to <clears throat> vindicate, you're an apostle, but you're also saying I'm base among you. It's like, what? What kind of a vindication is that? You should make yourself look great among us. It's just cool. All right, let's go on back to uh, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. That's just, that's just wonderful. <laughs> I just don't even know what to say about that. This glorious saying for all to see on the cross. Here's the king. Right here. You know, where we say, Lord, give me a sign. There's your sign. <laughs> My Lord, we want to, well, see, we want to, uh, I think in like Saddam Hussein's palace uh, in Iran or Iraq, I mean, you know, he had big statements and all this about him being the king. And the, I mean, he had statements that were from the Bible that said he was the omnipotent of all, da 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 da, the king of kings, and, you know, this kind of stuff like that. You know, written in gold and all this stuff on this big, beautiful palace. It, it could say very well, the, here is the king. But that's not where you're going to find the true king. God put a sign on the cross and said, look here, here is a true king. That over there is a usurper. That over there is a, is a faker. That is, these are not kings. Here is a king. See him in his kingly manner. See that he is not ruled by his fears. See that he is not ruled by pain. See that he is not ruled by circumstances. See that he is not ruled by pride. You know, don't you think that there was a lot of people that respected Jesus, that, that had thought highly of him for healing him, them or feeding them or something, that Jesus is looking out and go, you know, if, he, if, if it was us, we'd be thinking, 
what are those people thinking of me now? You know? What do they think now when I'm strung up here? Well, don't worry. God's got a sign. Here's the king. (laughs) There he is right there. Don't worry. Keep your eyes on him. That's the one. Okay, but look what happens next. Verse 20, this title then read, okay, we, we read that about many people. And so he, he, you know, Pilate wasn't playing at this. He put it in every big language he could get it so everybody could read the signs. Okay, verse 21, then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but he said I am the king of the Jews. <laughs> Isn't that just perfect? That's See, by saying just, here's the, you know, here's the king of the Jews, then people passing by might go, my God, there's the king of the Jews, you know, or something like that. But if you, he said he was, that's an accusation. And Pilate responds. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know where Pilate stands in the, in the midst of the whole thing. I mean, I, I, I've learned that Bathsheba wasn't what most people thought she was, and Pilate may not be either, but I don't know. I do know that in the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, was crucified, what, what I, I can't even remember offhand how, you know, to run through the thing, but um, by Pontius Pilate. So, but the Apostles' Creed is not necessarily God's view. So I, you know. But this guy said, look, you guys wanted somebody crucified that I could, I didn't find anything wrong in him. And and obviously he's got a problem. He doesn't have any backbone. He didn't go, go away, you little maggots, you little Pharisees and you know, high priests and stuff, go, I'm, I am the Roman leader here, and I don't find any fault in him. He's not going to be crucified. And if you keep it up, you're going to be crucified. One more word, little mealy mouth, you know. But he didn't, he didn't stand up for the Lord, and he didn't stand, he, he was moved by them, and he was moved by the fact that they said to him, we have no God but Caesar, no king but Caesar. And they said something along the line of, oh, you, you know, you serve Caesar, don't you? You know, trying to motivate him by fear and stuff. And, and I think that he was moved by some of those things. But here, when it came to this, look, I've, I put the sign up. What I've written, I've written. He finally, this is it. Well, That's sort of the place that you do need to stand up, actually. You don't need to stand up for him to keep him from being crucified, which, you know, Peter tried to do. He's the Lamb of God. He's the king that lays down his life. You don't stop that. That must take place. But when it comes from removing the sign from the reality that at the cross you'll find your king, it's time to stand up. No, that is the king. And you need to know it. You know. I remember when I was sharing in Holland and remembered the scripture that the that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, that the Pharisees and people standing around mocking said, he saved others himself, he cannot save. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, God, you are so incredible that you would have the heathen actually say the most powerful statement at the cross that He that is busy about saving others cannot be busy about saving himself. And once you start getting busy about saving yourself, 
you're probably not going to be busy about saving others. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, I just saw it clean as this, this beautiful megaphone horn just with those words coming out and declaring the greatest truth. Glory to God, he saved others so he cannot waste time trying to save himself. We always miss so much, don't we? If the Holy Spirit doesn't breathe on this book, have you ever noticed that it's just like almost any other book that you'd read? But when the Holy Spirit breathes on it, it is what? Spirit and life. Glory to God. Well, let's see. I've, I've, out of my notes, you'll be glad to know, so far I have said nine words. And we cannot continue to do this. But these things are important, amen? I mean, this is, this is incredible stuff. So let me read a little bit so I can get past some of this. Uh, when, Jesus, when he said, are you a king? And he said, you say that I am. He was not seeking to distinguish himself by power displays, but would, but would we see him as he is? Would we really see him as he is? Or does he have to do a power display? And remember, Pilate wasn't the only one he stood before. Who else did he stand before and was being judged? Yes, Caiaphas. Who else? Somebody higher. Somebody that actually was considered king. Herod. Herod. He brought him to Herod, and you know what Herod said? Turn this water into wine. Do, do some trick. Show me that you're the king. Show me that you're really it. If you'll do it, then I'll believe. That's what he said, that kind of stuff. Jesus didn't do anything. He was, not thinking, uh, he was not seeking to distinguish himself by power displays, but would we see him as he is? And since Herod didn't, he sent him back to Pilate and said, you handle this. <clears throat> and Jesus marveled that anyone saw the true depth of who he was, for he veiled that. And so... Let's go. We, we were talking about these scriptures not just a couple of paragraphs back. So let's turn to Matthew 16. And here we get that example of such a thing. Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Notice, he's still calling himself the Son of Man. That means he's veiled. That's the kenosis. That is, he could have said, Who do people say I, the kenosis man, am? It's the same thing. <clears throat> and they said... Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith, then, he saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And so he, Jesus is like, and the, and the words that I wrote here was he marveled that anyone saw the true depth of who he was because it had been veiled. He was not doing things outwardly to draw attention to that so that if anybody caught it, and remember, you say, well, he did miracles and this and that. After we finish this thing, whenever that takes place and move to that next section, we will deal with the miracles and show you in light of the truth how they didn't testify of deity. But that's another, that's another thing. Um, but clearly Jesus was moved by the fact that something had been revealed. What does the word reveal mean? What's another word for that? Unveiled. Aha. Uh -huh. So we're talking about what's behind the veil, what's in the Holy of Holies is veiled. And as long as that flesh is there, 
but when that flesh is rent, when he's crucified, and then we will see what's on the inside of him. And so Jesus is already alluding to that now, and he's saying, flesh and blood cannot open the veil, but my father seems to have slid back the veil because I didn't. I'm a kenosis one. And do you sort of get the idea Jesus is a little excited here? <laughs> Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. I mean, come on. How many times do you hear Jesus getting carried away? Almost none. You know. But this was exciting because somebody has seen beyond the pale, beyond the veil. Yes. him he did not do that I just thank God for that right there thank you father so then then verse uh, well maybe I should just go ahead and allude to some of this here um, verse 18 and I say unto thee thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it okay so he's He's not saying that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against Peter. Because Jesus later on had to pray for Peter, you know, just like he's praying for you. He's going to build his church on what? The revelation of Christ. Well, it says it right there. Doesn't it? Am I making this up? Am I twisting this? If I am, you people need to tell me. I know that you did, son. And, and uh, Satan had desired thee to sift thee. <laughs> and so the gates of hell, they, you know, folks, the gates of hell, this isn't the gates of Zion that won't cave in. This isn't us huddled around this li in this little thing and the, the hordes of Satan are banging against the gates and we're going, don't worry, they will not prevail. This is the gates of hell and we're beating on them with Christ and him crucified, with the revelation of Christ. And they're not going to hold us back. You say, but it seems like they are. No, it doesn't seem like it either. Oh, in the natural, yeah, if you live out, you know what? If you live out here, you're probably confused. But if you live in the truth, you know that this reality of Christ and him crucified is like a, a great, uh, uh, you know, battering ram. Boom, 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 and and. People in the world are deceived, or Christians are deceived even thinking, you know, look at that poor little group. The devil's got them surrounded and beating the fool at them. There's a certain, there's an angle of truth you can come at with that. There is. It's okay. There is an angle of truth you can come at. But there is the greater truth that with every dying, there is the power of resurrection that is banging against those gates and that will, will fall. In my lifetime, maybe not. In your lifetime, maybe not. But in the name of Jesus, yes. yes. And that's just a fact. And I believe that. And that's what keeps me going. Right. I don't live in the outward world. I live in the word of God. I live in him. And in him I move. And in him is my being. My being is not understood by outward things. Yes. And neither is yours. And so Jesus says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth. I'd like to get into all this, but this is it's going to get off from my, my thing right now. So let's drop on down uh, to verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Wait a minute, I'm confused now. Didn't he just start rejoicing and going, this is it, baby? The revelation of Christ is the thing that will build the church. It's the thing that will take the walls of uh, the gates of hell down. 
and it, they will not prevail. And then from that time forth began Jesus to talk to his disciples about the fact he's going to have to go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill him and everybody's going to turn against him and he's going to die. Why? Why? Because he's a kenosis man. He is a man in kenosis. Because he is not looking for official glory now. He is not trying to get the disciples all up and going, yes, 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 Jesus, 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 yes, yes, Super Bowl, yeah, and run out on the field and win it all, baby. He turns right around and discourages the fool out of them. Guess what? We're right on. We're right on with the truth. We've got the battering ramp of God, and I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die and get a, you know, I'm going to give my life, I am going to show forth the glory of nature, not the official glory of who I am. Yeah, and the disciples are supposed to go, this is our kingdom, it's a hidden kingdom. <laughs> we love it, we're with you. We'll die too, and they did, by the way. You know, they got it. Yes, oh. Four minutes. All right, maybe I should, uh, I'm getting a little excited here. Maybe I should. Uh, we'll come back and we'll look at, at some of this stuff that Jesus says and Peter's response in the next class. Take a break.